Let's draw some pictures representing the formation of a solution from a solid solute and a liquid solvent. The solute can be represented as a series of particles, the gray circles, neatly aligned left to right and top to bottom. An ordered arrangement like this is indicative of a crystalline solid, such as an ionic solid. Note that the circles do not take the shape of the container and do not fill it, just like we expect for a solid. When the particles making up the solid are bonded together in this way, we call them aggregated. This image therefore represents the aggregated solute particles being held together by solute-solute interactions. In the case of a crystalline ionic solid, these interactions are ion-ion intermolecular forces. To make the solution, we combine the aggregated solid with a solvent, such as a liquid. We can represent the liquid solvent like this, with the blue circles representing the particles that make up the liquid. These particles could be water molecules if we were making an aqueous solution. Note that the particles of the solvent take the shape of the container and are more randomly arranged than the aggregated solute particles. This is just what the particles in a liquid do. When the particles making up the liquid are loosely associated like this, held together by solvent-solvent interactions, we refer to them as aggregated. This image therefore represents aggregated solvent particles. When mixed, the solute particles disperse in the solvent. Solvent particles move away from each other to make room for the new solute particles, and the solute particles fill those spaces. The result is a homogeneous mixture of solute and solvent. A representation of this is shown here, where the gray and the blue circles have been evenly mixed in a random fashion. This is a representation of the solution. These images show a change from initial state to final state. Everything on the left of the arrow is the initial state, the solution on the right is the final state. The change in enthalpy that occurs during this process is the enthalpy of the final state, the enthalpy of the solution, minus the enthalpy of the initial state, the combined enthalpy of the aggregated solute and the aggregated solvent. The symbol for this difference is delta H sub SOLN, and we call it either the enthalpy of solution or the heat of solution. The heat of solution can be negative, making the solution process exothermic. It can be positive, making the solution process endothermic. Technically, the heat of solution could be exactly zero, but this is unlikely given the large number of ways to obtain a heat of solution that is not zero. Based on this description, all we really know is that the solute and the solvent have mixed and have either released energy or required an energy input. There's nothing here that gives us any insight into why the heat of solution might be endothermic or exothermic. That's a question we want to try to answer. Why are some heats of solution negative and some positive? To make any progress answering this question, we have to move beyond thinking about solution formation as a single step process. Solution formation in a single step involves going directly from the initial state, consisting of the aggregated solute and aggregated solvent, to the final state, consisting of the solution. In that single step, the solution is formed. We can show this single step change on what is called an enthalpy diagram. This type of diagram shows enthalpy increasing along the vertical axis and has horizontal lines to indicate the enthalpy of states of the system, such as the initial state and the final state. Changes in enthalpy are indicated with an arrow drawn from the initial state to the final state. This arrow is the enthalpy change associated with solution formation, and so it is the heat of solution. It is positive because it goes up, indicating that the enthalpy of the final state is larger than the enthalpy of the initial state. This enthalpy diagram therefore shows an endothermic solution process. This is a good approximation of what actually happens in the laboratory when a solution is made. The solute and solvent are mixed, and the solution forms, and it appears to happen in one step. But the heat of solution is the same regardless of how many steps there are between the initial state and the final state. If we wanted to, we could eliminate the single step and instead go from the initial to the final state by stopping at an intermediate state first. This makes solution formation a two-step process, first going from the initial state to the intermediate state and then from the intermediate state to the final state. When combined, the enthalpy change for each step adds to give delta H solution. We don't have to stop at two steps. We could have three, four, or any number of steps. The outcome is the same. No matter how many steps or how large the enthalpy change is for each step, as long as the steps start in the initial state and end in the final state, the heat of solution is the same. We can do this because energy and enthalpy are what are known as state functions. That means they depend only on the initial and final states and not on the number or the type of steps taken between the initial and the final state. The more correct way to say this is that the number of steps and the types of steps define the path followed from initial to final state. Therefore, state functions are independent of path. To compute the enthalpy change for a process, the only things you need to know are the enthalpy of the final state and the enthalpy of the initial state so that you can take the difference. The number of steps and the types of steps, the path, you take to get from the initial to the final state do not matter. We are now going to use this to our advantage to better understand the enthalpy changes during solution formation.
We know that to form a solution, we need to combine the aggregated solute with the aggregated solvent, but we are not going to do this in a single step. Instead, we will do this in a sequence of three steps that add up to the overall process. First, we take the aggregated solute particles and separate them, breaking all solute-solute interactions. This is step one. This process is always endothermic because breaking the interactions that hold particles to each other always requires an input of energy. The symbol used for this enthalpy change is delta H subscript solute. It's the enthalpy change associated with separating the aggregated solute particles and it is always positive. The more strongly the particles of the solute are held to each other, the larger the value of delta H solute. Next we take the solvent particles and separate them, breaking all solvent-solvent interactions. This is step two. Separating the solvent particles is always endothermic. Even though the particles in a liquid solvent are not bonded to each other, they are weakly associated by intermolecular forces. It always takes energy to overcome these intermolecular interactions. The symbol for this enthalpy change is delta H subscript solvent. It is always positive. The more strongly the particles of the liquid are associated with each other, in other words, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the larger the value of delta H solvent. We now take the separated solute particles and the separated solvent particles and allow them to mix to find their lowest energy. This is step three. The result is the solution. This process is always exothermic because interactions form between the particles of the solute and solvent due to intermolecular attractions. Formation of these interactions, like the formation of bonds, is always exothermic. The symbol for this is delta H subscript mix. The stronger the mutual interaction between the solute and solvent particles, the more negative the value of delta H mix. Note that we start with aggregated solute and aggregated solvent and end with solution just like we did when we formed the solution in one step, but now we are doing this in three steps. It's fair to ask, what did we gain by doing this? What we have gained is a model for thinking about the energy changes during solution formation. We can now think of the heat of solution as a sum of three enthalpy changes. The first is the enthalpy change for separating solute particles from each other, delta H solute. The second is the enthalpy change for separating solvent particles from each other, delta H solvent. The third is the enthalpy change when separated solute and separated solvent particles are allowed to interact and form associations. That's delta H mix. Physically, delta H solute represents the strength of the solute-solute interactions. It is always positive. Delta H solvent represents the strength of the solvent-solvent interactions and is also always positive. Delta H mix represents the strength of the solute-solvent interactions and is always negative. It is more negative the stronger the solute-solvent interactions. Delta H solute and delta H solvent can be thought of as the price paid for solution formation because they require an energy input to overcome or break interactions. These are the things working against solution formation because they constrain particle motion, preventing dispersal. On the other hand, delta H mix is the payment received for making the solution because energy is released. It works in favor of solution formation because it makes it favorable for solute and solvent particles to disperse and get close to each other. Exothermic solution formation is therefore favored with a small value of delta H solute and delta H solvent and a large negative value for delta H mix. This means solute-solute and solvent-solvent interactions are weak and the solute-solvent interactions are strong. Basically, the costs are low and the returns are high. Endothermic solution formation is favored with a large value of delta H solute and delta H solvent and a small negative value for delta H mix. This means the solute-solute and solvent-solvent interactions are strong and the solute-solvent interactions are weak. Basically, the costs are high and the returns are low. This may be easier to visualize and understand with an enthalpy diagram, and that is the subject of another micro-lecture. And that's enthalpy changes during solution formation.